All right, it is 11.15, so we're going to get started. Uh, I'm going to say a couple of things up front. One, you are welcome to interject with questions at any time. You do not have to save them until the end. When people save questions until the end, they forget them, so don't worry about that. Just go ahead and ask. Second, if you do interrupt and ask, you'll be doing me a favor because over the course of the pandemic, I went from being a coffee to a tea drinker. And having not traveled a lot as a tea drinker, I didn't realize that they don't bother to stock actual caffeinated teas at places like this. So I am running on minimal caffeine and you will help keep me awake if you interject. So let's go ahead and get started. If the clicker will work. It worked fine when I was testing. Oh, I've got a prompt over here. Okay, my name is Rogan Hamby. I'm an analyst for Equinox. I won't belabor the point. If you want to contact me outside here, here are my Twitter and Mastodon links. Fortunately, I have both fairly uncommon first and last names, so I am easily findable. Equinox offers a whole bunch of different products. If you're interested in any of these things, because we do more than ILSs, feel free to stop by our booth. That will be the last sales related thing I say. Aaron? Thanks, Rogan. I'm Aaron DeVries. I'm the manager of digital and support services at St. Thomas Public Library. Uh, can you go to the next slide there, Rogan? St. Thomas is located halfway between Toronto and Detroit, just on the north side of Lake Erie there. So we got beaches, it's fine. We're close to beaches, different beaches than your beaches. Um, I'm gonna let Rogan introduce the story. So once upon a time, about middle of last year, I was sitting around and I got an email that said, hey, we have this library in Ontario that wants to migrate to Evergreen. And I said, okay. So we did that. And Aaron was one of the representatives from St. Thomas that worked on the project with me. I was the data analyst, which meant I took the data from their old system and smashed it and hit it and kicked it and pushed it into shape for Evergreen and shoved it in. But I did want to point out two folks that were not able to join us today that were also critical on the project. My colleague, Erica Rolfs, from Equinox, who was the project manager, and Aaron's colleague, Nadine Polos, am I saying that right? Okay, uh, who is with St. Thomas and was also very important to the project. And this particular topic that we're gonna to talk about today, the circulating seed collection and some customizations we did to Evergreen for it, started with this message that I got from Erica in our internal Slack channel one day. Just as an FYI, the other thing that came up was seeds, redacted, this is their old ILS. I have been deposed about ILSs in the past. I am trying to avoid that these days. It is very awkward for circulating these seed packets that they want to track on an account, but not be due back. So. Yes, so obviously we deal with seeds at St. Thomas Public Library. Um, seed libraries are not real. I wouldn't call them a new thing anymore. They've been around for a little while. You've probably all heard of them. In fact, maybe some or all of you have some in your libraries. Any libraries here? Raise your hand if you have a seed library or if you're associated with volunteers who run a seed library and that happen to use your space. Sorry, hold up your hands. Okay, interesting. And how many of you catalog those seeds? Oh, cool. Excellent. <laughs> but then you wouldn't be able to do the cool things we're going to talk about today. Uh, or you could just not catalog them, but we can talk. Uh, so St. Thomas Public Library launched its seed library in 2016. The seed library is a repository of uh, open pollinated, mainly heirloom seeds available to library card holders completely free. Members come to the library and borrow seeds for their garden. They grow the plants in their garden. At the end of the season, season, they're encouraged to let the plants go to seed. And from those plants, they're encouraged to collect seeds and return the same amount of seed or more as they borrowed at the beginning of the growing season. Since seed is a living thing, it must be renewed each year somewhere by someone 
or unique varietals can become extinct. So this is, there's a lot of emphasis on this from our staff because there's a lot of passion behind this project. It started as a, uh, I, I would say a passion project from one or two staff members and it's grown since 2016 uh, to, to uh, different staff members as well. Uh, so our mission statement for the Seed Library is to educate our community in the importance of seed saving while fostering a culture of sharing, self-reliance, and community resilience, preserving and perpetuating Elgin County's rich agrarian roots. So what started as a passion project by the staff quickly picked up steam and has become a major part of what we offer, not only on the collection side of things, but also through our regular programming. So Seed Library orientations, seed starting and seed saving workshops, and especially our annual CD Saturday event, which draws hundreds of attendees every year. Um, we're not a big library. We have about 30 staff. We serve a population of about 40,000 or so people. And so when we do an event that draws hundreds of people, it's kind of our big deal. So we we know that that we're, we're striking a chord in our community. Um, so while seed libraries have become more common, as I mentioned, um, not everybody is cataloging them. And there can be a lot of frustrations when you try to do so because you're putting a square peg in a round hole. So on that note, I'm gonna pass it over to Rogan again. Oh, no, wait, there we go. There's an example of our mark record. And I do have to admit when this came up for about 60 seconds, I wondered about the possibilities of using DNA sequencing with authority records for seeds and then decided that way pure madness lie. And I, I didn't want to e even do that to myself to think about it more and moved on. Yeah, uh, although interesting possibilities. Um, so, but we did do some brainstorming about this. What can we do? And, you know, I do a lot of migrations for consortia, which are great, they're rewarding, I love doing them, but consortia come with a lot of overhead. And there's a freedom in migrating an individual library because Evergreen has a lot of abilities for customization that you can just kind of go, oh, yeah, we can do that. You're the only ones who have to make a decision about it. You don't have to take it back to a board and think about the impact on a whole bunch of other people. And so in that spirit, we thought, okay, so you have these things. You want to check them out, but you don't care about checking them back in but they are cataloged. So there is gonna be a circ record, but you don't want that really against the patron. Yeah, and you, and you, and you wanna make them holdable. And there are all these factors and nothing in Evergreen quite fit just, I mean, several options were almost there, but not quite right. And then I thought, well, why don't we make a custom action trigger? And when we talk about action triggers, I find that the concept is synonymous to a lot of people with notices. Now, how many people here have heard of action triggers? How many people think about them in the context of more than notices? A few people, good. Well, I thought, well, what if we make an action trigger to fill in this custom behavior for this specific type of item by circulation modifier so that we just let the computer do it rather than, because the previous discussion had been, well, what if these are sort of pulled up on a report? And what if a staff member goes through and makes a bucket and we do some custom editing? And this didn't really seem like a progress from their legacy system to me. And th this is my very simple slide to explain to people what action triggers fundamentally are. You have a hook. A hook basically is, here's some condition in the system to match. You know, like an item is being checked out. A hold is made available. These are hooks in Evergreen. An item goes overdue. And when people get, say, a notice for something's 10 days overdue, it's because the item is overdue hook has been activated with a 10-day delay. And then is a condition still true? In the case of the overdue, is it still overdue? Has it actually been turned back in in the interim? And then something to happen. And I needed something to represent a verb, so I just chose a kid and playing with yarn because it seemed appropriate for the audience. So that's what action triggers fundamentally are. A hook, a matching condition, to see if it's true, and then something it does afterwards. Now the, uh, I'm gonna go back a second. Now the first two 
are pretty much hard coded in evergreen. If you want to add new options for those, that is development that has to go into a release and has to go a full development cycle. However, that last one is actually pretty flexible. It does require development, but it can be done outside the main evergreen files. It just has to be within the area of the server that Evergreen looks for reactors. That's what Evergreen calls those actions, reactors. We're going to react to the hook by doing this thing. And this is an example of the action trigger statement, the uh, definition that we developed for St. Thomas. They you migrated on 3.8. Yeah, so they didn't have the Angular version yet, but will in your next upgrade. And it will look very similar to other action triggers you've looked at for notices and things like that. You know, we gave it a name, make seeds non-holdable on checkout. What is the hook? What tells the system to do something? Well, that the item's being checked out. What is the reactor? Well, I like very obscure and hard to follow names for things. So I named it Mark non-holdable <laughs> because the seed's not coming back. There's no point in having holds on it until the next season when the seeds are being replenished. And I, I was told once that it's not a true presentation until you put a slide of code up. So this is the entirety, well, not the entirety. It is most of the code for that custom dev work we did. There's a little bit more at the top and bottom that I didn't put on here that's kind of boilerplate stuff. But this is the actual what it does. And unlike some code, this is almost English readable. Hey, let's check the circ mod of this on this on the item for the checkout. Okay, does it equal seed? Okay, well, if it does, then let's say that it's being edited right now and we're gonna mark it not holdable and we're gonna commit this change to the database. That's it. That is how hard it is to make this kind of customization in Evergreen. And if you're right now sitting going, wow, that's simple, it is. But there was a little bit of a wrinkle. Okay, so that solved the holds issue, which was actually a pretty big headache. And just to go back on that a little bit, uh, in our previous ILS, which will go unnamed, we, um, we just never allowed holds because it, it was way too much of a headache to try to manage the fact that seeds that were in somebody's hands were receiving holds and they wouldn't be fulfilled and it was a lot of hands-on management then covid came we got shut down we wanted to get those seeds in people's hands so we just dealt we just did it so we turned on holds then we reopened and we had holds on we had expectations from the public that's when this started sorry i should have said that all before all of this however so this solved the holds thing and staff are very happy we're very excited and i got i think i fired off an email to rogan I was like, okay, so I ran this report to pull all of the checked out seeds and I need to do something with them to check them back in, but I don't want them to appear as available as soon as they get checked in because the other maintenance thing that I had been doing that I had neglected to tell uh, Rogan was, was that every year I would have to do a bulk check-in off of a list of seeds to get them off of people's accounts so that they don't show up as overdue. Right, so the seeds have been checked out for 365 days. You got to make sure some point during the year you're going to get them all back in again. And this is all a manual process, so it was a lot of work for somebody. Um, so I was excited about Evergreen with buckets because that was better than what I was using before. So I'm scanning them in, I'm doing a report, I'm copying and pasting barcodes into buckets to do some editing, and I'm all happy because it's better than what it was. And I said that to Rogan, and. I said, why? I mean, buckets are cool tools, don't get me wrong, but to me, buckets are for one-off things, you know, where the either the task is uncommon or uh, unpredictable, or the materials inside the buckets are unpredictable. You know, if you have a bucket of items for your display shelf, well, I mean, those items on the
thing is that with those still living in the system is if somebody does return their seed packet, either empty or filled with their own seeds, it's a usable seed packet that can be checked in and dealt with or, or whatever. And there's a, there's a process for that. Um, yeah, so we can go to the next slide. So for us, this means less time managing records, more time to focus on how we do our packaging, marketing, and the programs, which it was really like an annual event where three or four of our staff would get together and be like, how do we do this again? And then we have to figure out how to manage the records and do all those things. So taking that out of the way, we've already had a couple of meetings where that's not even on the agenda because Evergreen's just doing it. So we're excited. We're grateful. We're happy. Uh, so again, we'll see this December what kind of changes we need to make to the process, but it should be should be pretty good. So we kind of went through that quickly, and I apologize if I looked awkwardly back and forth, but I think my laptop was possessed by a ghost for a moment. Um, so we wanted to open up the rest of this time for questions, discussion, people to share how they handle special collections, um, how you might envision action triggers benefiting you, all kinds of things. I mean, that's part of the value of the conference, not just listening to us stand up here, but cross-communication. Yeah, it does. So the there there could be ten barcodes under the the record of petunia seeds of the bib. Uh, and forgive me if I'm not using the right terminology yet. I'm still getting used to Evergreen's terminology versus our previous one. But so there'd be a bib record, one bib record for petunia seeds, and then there would be several copies, just like if you had multiple copies of the book. So somebody checks it out. Yep. The action trigger flips that to non holding. Yes. Somebody checks it out, plants them in May, turns whatever's left, or they're 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 heirloom seeds. Yes. And then it goes to buy it. It's not it won't go out again until it gets paper. It so seeds won't be made available again until they're manually put back to available. Because when they get checked in automatically in December, they get they get marked as bindery. And that just stops any records from automatically becoming available before somebody has put their hands on those seed packets to either give it a new barcode and swap it out in the bib record or to, or sorry, in the copy record or to use, reuse that same barcode and scan it in and make it available once it's been refilled and, and packaged. And our packets include an empty packet for returning and information about growing the seed. And so there's a lot of maintenance that happens on those that Evergreen can't help us with. <laughs> That's just a, a natural thing of the seed library. Frustrating for some, others love it. Um, but getting rid of the the need to maintain the records is kind of what we had we had hoped with this process. Yeah, unfortunately, Evergreen can't help fill out the uh, kits that uh, as they are given um, and, until we have a plug in with an AI and robotic system. But, you know, check back in with us in 2040. <laughs> we don't really care. Yeah, we don't hold it against them. Uh, at all. So we encourage people from the learning side of things and exploring the idea of seed saving and harvesting and all of that. That's kind of the emphasis of why we do this. We run a lot of workshops and we bring in a lot of speakers and uh, different people from the community to kind of emphasize the the importance of seed saving and, and especially native local seeds and what's in your garden and all of that. Um, this is just a, another vehicle for that conversation more than anything else. Yeah, but we do purchase seeds every year to refill the collection as well. I think there was a question at the back. Yes. There's no renewals or anything like that that have to, to play into this. So yes, so the question is, uh, the patron checks it out. How long is the checkout period? I believe we put on, is it 365? Yeah. yeah, 365 days. So as long as this is running at the beginning of every December, theoretically, it'll catch every checkout.
That's right. Yeah. So, so if you are a patron and you check out an item in April, some seeds that you're going to go plant. I mean, I don't know when you all do your planting, but we do ours. April, probably May, May, June. It's Canada. It's July. We're planting in July. No. Um, and that will sit on your account. You will see that you have that checked out until December, which we kind of liked that timing because we, if people want to reference what they've checked out and kind of keep, keep track of that. Um, and then also through our, uh, like we're on Biblio Commons as well. So they'll see it on, on their account when they log in and they can kind of keep tabs on what seeds they had checked out this past year kind of thing. And then it'll just disappear. No, we, we actually are fine free on everything. So fines aren't, aren't connected to anything. Yes. <laughs> they are standard evergreen circ policies and all that. So, you know, if you ever wanted to associate, you know, a loss charge with them or something, you could, but since they're being auto checked in, that's never going to kick in. If anybody's curious to see what it looks like on our on our evergreen, I've got my laptop here and and afterwards we could we could take a look if you're really interested in seeing what the either the mark record. I'm not an expert on on mark or cataloging, uh, but I can show you what our catalogers have come up with for this in a little closer detail. I'm happy to do that. So we get subject headings as filters in our in our catalog as well we've got a bunch of information we yeah it's not it's not a huge amount of information there's so the practical side i'd say the subject headings and the topic fields that appear in biblio commons then are quite nice for filtering uh if we just had the titles in there our staff wouldn't be as happy the ones who love the seed collection so much that they'd like to see it represented really well and then also the the people who are browsing from home do want to see okay so this is this is a trellising plant this is you know we have we have certain language that's kind of standard for the different types of growing methods and things and those are all put into the description in the record um yeah i wouldn't say the amount of information in the record is overdoing it we've stick to what would be helpful for somebody who maybe doesn't know a lot about that plant. You do have me thinking about taxonomy for plants and mark records now. Yes. And so there's so much more that you can do over what you should do. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And so again, and this, this all goes back to passion projects for staff and giving them some space to do some some stuff as well. I think it's important. But. The question was, what is the check-in script? Well, I briefly considered learning a new language like Rust and then, you know, compiling it. And But then I decided to just do a SQL script in cron job. Yeah, <laughs> because there's no reason to overcomplicate this. <laughs> no. I hope so soon. Yeah, this it would be just as easy as a book. Yeah, I mean, you just put it in your courier, right? Or, or however you transit. Sorry, not all systems would have. Right. Sure. So the politics between branches may get in the way. Systems. systems. Sorry, not branches. Systems. I'm unfamiliar with the consortium approach, so this is different than... And all consortia are different just for... Uh, uh the viewing and listening audience, I suppose. Um, in the South, we're largely built on county-based systems where there's a county library uh, with branches. 
So the consortia is generally kind of three tier consortia system, which are usually counties, although not always, and then uh, branches underneath that. So, uh, and, and these kind of, of course, follow the same rules that any evergreen hold policy can set up. Now, when you do set up custom action triggers, though, you do have to think about the impact. This is probably something that a consortia would not want to implement for a single library because it does add on an action trigger that's checking every single checkout. But if a consortia is following similar practices and lots of libraries are doing seed libraries, it might be a reasonable choice. Right. Right, and it was pointed out you'd have to add a circ modifier and every consortia has their own approach to that but hopefully not make anything you want anytime you want. <laughs> Most consortia have some sort of administrative decision-making uh, in terms of circ modifiers. Uh, We see these as opportunities to have discussions with our customers. So again, we're not we're not a huge library system where this where this is happening. So there's uh, the the staff understand the process. They know how it's working. They have a conversation with the customer when they call or they ask about it. I wouldn't say anybody gets too upset or anything. If they're confused, they very quickly figure out what it is. Uh, and again, with the title and everything showing up on their account, they'll hopefully remember. Unless you know one of their kids checked it out or something like what. What are they doing? Yeah, milkweed. What's why is there milkweed on my? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think we have a question. Yep. Um, so I just wanted to go back to what you were saying a second ago, Rogan. Um, that basically, like this, the script that you have would be inserted in a new row into the action trigger table for every single circulation. Okay. Um, it, this is a more technical question, and. Uh, the question is about inserting rows on the action trigger table. Uh, th there's not an action trigger table per se, that's a schema and there's a bunch of different tables. This is involves creating a new action trigger definition and then a new action trigger reactor. So you do have to list that in the database as well after you put the little bit of code that it is on the server. Um, it's for those curious, its length is about two tweets long. Um, <laughs> and then that will create events as people check out. Yeah. So whether or not this is impactful on your system is something you have to look at. Uh, because it does look at every checkout, it is an extremely small amount of resource use, but cumulatively, it does add up. Now, for a standalone library like St. Thomas, it makes absolute sense. Uh, for a consortia where there are a lot of seed circulating libraries with these similar needs, it might very well make sense, but that is an analysis you have to do yourself. However, for a consortia where one library does it and the other 99 don't, it probably won't. Yeah, another question? I, I mean, it comes down to the importance you put on the seed library itself. So if you have the staffing resources to do the work, I don't think the amount of work scales up. You have a certain number of varieties. You may have more copies, right? And so I, I you, uh, yeah, I, I personally think that if it's important that, that scaling it up to the size of the system shouldn't be a huge issue. Um, as long as there's a workflow in place and, and all of that, kind of what Rogan is talking about as well. Some ILSs will handle it better than others. That's what we've learned. 
Uh, so it's just whether it's just depends how much customization, how much control you have over your ILS as well. So again, keeping in mind, we're pretty small. We don't have a team that's, that's doing custom, custom code work. So, and you know, to be fair, even with the previous ILS, yes, I had tried contacting them to figure out a solution for this and I didn't really get anywhere, but if I had a more staff myself that had knowledge and expertise, maybe they'd be able to ask the right questions and push it in the right direction. So I wouldn't write off every ILS, but Evergreen was fantastic for this. I have a question, actually, actually, yes. And Erica from, from Biblio Commons, it would be fantastic to have a format called Seeds. No, but I just texted, I just Thank you. Yeah, because, well, and, and I mean, that, that goes into this whole question again of what Rogan just said, you know, if, if you have multiple uh, libraries within your consortium, do you just make a new circ modifier for everything that you do? And, and, you know, when I reached at Biblio Commons, that was kind of the answer. And I understand that completely. They can't make a new format code for every single thing that every library wants to do. But now that all of us are going to do this, and all of us are going to sign on to Biblio Commons. Then, no, I'm just kidding. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, yeah, if you can put in a good word. I have a question for Rogan. If this was not the solution, what would be your second solution? This one. Uh, my backup punt solution probably would have been a daily cron job to flip these over. But, but that's inelegant because you want the change to be reflected immediately on the account because if something's running daily or something, then somebody tries to put a hold on in the intervening hours. And I mean, who wants that? That creates aggravation for staff. The whole point of computers, and I know this is hard to see sometimes in the modern world, but supposedly they're to make our lives easier. <laughs> sometimes it doesn't feel that way, does it? But this was uh, an example of a situation where this was not a dev project. We didn't do a contract for this. We were just doing the migration. And I was like, yeah, this won't take that much work. So we just did it in addition. And I do think there are a lot of libraries doing seeds now. So I'm entirely in support of BiblioCommons adding it. And now I'm curious about BiblioCon, but I can ask you about that later. <laughs> someone could ask i was just waiting for you to ask so right now uh as of this morning we have 271 different varieties in evergreen um at the end of march i pulled more specific numbers we had 474 packets available uh and 175 had been checked out now that's pretty early in our growing season i'm sure a lot more have been checked out already uh, and to give you a sense of scale, uh, I have about 1,300 records that are currently in bindery. So that's just the the maintenance. So the ones that are sitting, ones that had gone out that didn't come back. It needs it needs some cleanup, probably. Again, we're small enough that our catalogers are like, ah, oh, we'll deal with it later, probably, right? So uh, they could delete some of those those bindery records, but yes. Oh, that's not a question that I predicted and I should have. So I can find out. I can find out very quickly. I'll follow up on it. Somebody think of a Rogan question and I'll find out because I can message the person who does the purchasing. Elaine was just sharing that in Pines, a number of libraries are partnering with local gardening associations and getting the seeds um, gratis from them. And I've heard that from a number of other libraries. I know a lot of libraries in Evergreen, Indiana are doing seed collections, um, as, as well as individual libraries, other places. I've seen a bunch of cool pictures on social media of old card catalogs repurposed as seed drawers. Uh, and I think this is really neat. I don't know if any libraries have done initiatives to have uh, gardeners say Instagram or tweet photos of what they grow from the seed collections, but that would be a cool, you know, sort of outreach thing. Nadine is on it. So she says, 
We normally buy about $500 worth of seeds and then get a ton of donations, which is true. So our, our annual CD Saturday event, a uh, big part of that is a seed swap. Uh, and then we get um, local farmers and growers and even some seed companies from, from kind of Southwestern Ontario uh, show up and then they often donate to the library as well. Uh, so depending on the year, we get quite a, quite a lot from the donations, but then there's always certain varieties that we know, like everybody wants to grow tomatoes. So you got to make sure you got enough tomatoes. So then you buy some of those to supplement or whatever, right? Uh, it's, it's kind of fluctuated due to COVID again. And during COVID at one point, we did stop checking them out and we just gave them away. <laughs> Let's just stop dealing with this. That made it easier. Um, but in and around 800, I'd say would be the average 800 checkouts um, a year. And the $500 purchase we did this year, we wouldn't have done that every year in the last few years. It's not it's not a consistent set amount that we're that we're spending. Kind of look at it and see what we need. Uh, having done this and migrated and set it up better, we're looking at everything now to make it all better. Uh, we're going to change the way that we package them and make it a little bit less hands-on for staff. Uh, try to simplify some things as well. So try to make it a little less resource intensive. It's the Cadillac of seed libraries right now. It's just hard to keep up with it. So, and I think anybody who does one can probably understand that. It takes a lot of time. I wouldn't have that number available here. And it's it's pretty hard to say because with the seed swap on CD Saturday, when they come back, it's hard to know whether that was one of our seeds or not, right? So, and again, so for us to keep, to look at the, for us, the outcomes are bigger than the circ numbers or, or any kind of transactional measurement. Uh, it's the bigger conversation around things. Uh, so the reason why we have the seed library again is to create connection. Our mission statement is we connect at the library. And so we connect people with their local growers and, and into those conversations about growing and all of that. And so even from a programming standpoint, the collection serves to support the programs and the workshops and the conversations that happen. Yeah. And I know it's not exactly analogous, but you know, when I think of qualitative collections, I think back to when I was a collection development manager and I had to argue for creating a, Sp a Spanish language collection, especially Spanish juvenile uh, in a community that did not perceive itself as having a Spanish speaking population, even though the census numbers clearly told a different story. Um, and sometimes you have to make a qualitative argument and say, this isn't about just CERC numbers. Sometimes it's about community engagement. Yeah. Yeah, so we used to say 10, we've upped it to 15 right now. Um, people get around that, <laughs> like everything else. But if they do, it's with multiple cards and all their kids' cards and which is totally fine. The whole family's doing it then, right? My cousin's gotten a library card for the first time and checking out seeds and nothing but seeds. <laughs> it's perfect. But we all see this with other materials. There's nothing new. Are there any other questions? Ooh, number one do. Uh, stay on top of it is the number one do because and I'm speaking about before we had this set up. And so again, uh, it'll be interesting to revisit this conversation, Rogan, in December to see kind of how this how this works. Rogan was wanting me to say, okay, how is it going now? I'm like, well, we'll see, <laughs> right? We haven't had to do the annual maintenance yet. Uh, but I can speak for years past when it, there was a lot of work if you didn't, if you have this annual thing that you do and nobody thinks about it until that time, everybody forgets what they're supposed to do. 
right? And so document, 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 like make sure that the process is written down exactly what you're doing and why, because people need to understand, the catalogers need to understand why they're putting it into bindery. They need to understand um, why it's in bindery to begin with. What can they do with these records that are in bindery? If you don't have everything that's written down, then the next cataloger who comes along is you know, the whole thing's going to fall apart again. So we, we've we got to document the process, make sure that um, each year it's not a surprise as to what should happen. Otherwise, you get you get behind. And then you do, actually, there was one year <laughs> where you do suddenly get a lot of people calling saying, I have this overdue on my account <laughs> that's a cucumber. <laughs> and it's not veggie tails. I don't know, like... So that, yeah. And then he's like, okay, we need a meeting. So we got to figure out what, what are we supposed to do about this again, right? Because we didn't have it written down. So anyway, yes. And the don't do, the don't do. Uh, that's a tough one. I <laughs> don't forget about it. Exactly. Um, yeah, I, I think, you know what though? The don't do, I think I'd be careful. And this one, started as one person was really into the idea and we let them run with it and they did really well with it, but it became more work than they could handle. And so I think from the very beginning, we needed to make sure that it was a team effort, that it wasn't just one person. And I think with seed libraries, this can be common. There's probably similar passion project type things in libraries as well, but you'll get the people who love it and the people who are just like, why are we doing this, right? So you need the entire team to be on board and understand the value of it. So don't just let one person run with it. I think make sure that it's a group effort and that there's an understanding of why you're doing what you're doing before you get it even started, right? More questions. Actually, I think we're pretty close to time. So I, let's go ahead and call it. People can hit the restrooms and get refreshments before next events, but thank you for joining us.